So unless those things are addressed over the long term, the conflict is going to continue in the foreseeable future. And Bashar al-Assad has been very, uh, been very emphatic in saying that he wants to regain control over the entire country. He has control over about 60 percent or okay. so, give or take, uh, 5 or 10 percent. And the nature of control varies in the, uh, whatever part of the country you're, you're talking about. Most of the large cities are under uh, Syrian government control. There are, however, pockets of resistance, particularly in the province of Idlib in the northwest, northwest area that's controlled by the Syrian opposition with Turkish help. Uh, Turkish troops are in the north along with uh, uh, free Syrian army elements that are, that are doing their uh, fighting, in essence, in the north. The Kurds still have, uh, with U.S. and Russian support, actually, have uh, a portion of the country in the north, uh, northeast. And then there's still pockets of uh, the Islamic State, ISIS, uh, that, uh, that exist in Syria. So all that still has to be corralled in, so to speak, and uh, with Iranian and Russian help, he's been able to survive. Whether he can finish the job and gain control over the entire country, that remains to be seen. It will be as much diplomatic as it is military. Because there was a time, correct me if I'm wrong, where even his survival as ruler of Syria was not a given. Oh, absolutely. I mean, his demise was predicted uh, a number of occasions. Yeah. In fact, one time I went to Syria during the uh, during the war, it went to Damascus, and Damascus was entirely surrounded except for one road. And I was in Beirut, and we had to call ahead to our, some UN liaison in uh, Damascus to see, is that road clear? And they yeah. said, well, except for the IEDs that may that exist there, you, you should be fine. So that was, a, that was a low point, early 2013. In the summer of 2015, uh, Bashar al-Assad gave a remarkable speech where he admitted to the country, you know, quite contrary to what he'd done before this time, that we're not going to be able to control uh, the rest of the country or gain control of the rest of the country anytime soon. We are low on resources. And that was a strong signal to their Russian allies in particular that he was on the verge of per perhaps falling yeah. or certainly uh, uh, being uh, uh, diminishing his, his power and influence in the country. And that's when Russia, just a couple of months later, September 30th, essentially became the Syrian Air Force and intervened militarily and turned things around. Did they, for lack of a better word, did they bail him out? Absolutely, as well as the Iranians. I mean, the Iranians and the Russians uh, are the primary reasons, I think, uh, why Bashar al-Assad has survived, in addition to the fact that, that uh, Bashar al-Assad and uh, his supporters, their back was against the wall. I mean, it, it was an existential fight. Uh, if they were removed from power, they'd probably be killed. Uh, and I, I remember one Syrian opposition uh, fighter who I, I met uh, in Syria, and he said, we hate fighting uh, the Alawite militias, the Alawite parts of the Syrian army, because the Alawites are the about 10, 11 percent of the country, Bashar al-Assad is an Alawite, and they control most of the military security apparatus. And I said, why? He said, because they fight to the death. Other guys, they'll, you know, they'll, uh, they'll surrender uh, or they'll give up, but these guys fight to the death. And that's kind of uh, the situation that the, the Syrian uh, government, Bashar al-Assad and his supporters saw themselves in. It was a fight to the death. It was an existential fight. And in the end, you know, I, I tell students sometimes, you know, someone wins a battle simply because they wanted it more than the other side. Uh, they were more uh, they were more united than the other side, and in essence, that was the case here. That's kind of how he won it, you know, with help from mm -hmm. the Iranians and the Soviet Union. What did he win? Will he will yeah. Syria ever be the same country that he used to rule? No, it, it won't, and he has to realize this, and that's one of the things. Uh, you know, I've talked to a number of Syrian government uh, people that are close to Bashar al-Assad over the last uh, few years. And they all say, yes, we cannot go back to the authoritarian structure we, we had uh, you know, for, for decades. But I don't think they've really thought about what comes next. And I don't think they've real, they really appreciate that most of the country, even in government-controlled areas, have been empowered by the fact that they've lived without the state for years. Mm -hmm. you know, they've, they've governed themselves. Uh, the militias that were pro-government, essentially, you know, they, they uh, acted independently. And all these people expect rewards. And so the patronage network, again, that the Assad's father and son meticulously built over the decades was shattered. So they need a, no, a new socio-political contract with the country. And that has to be renegotiated uh, entirely uh, from Assad's point of view. And I don't think they real, really realize how to do that. I mean, they're more interested in survival right now and economic survival. Uh, but they really haven't thought through what it will take to move forward uh, with even those that remained loyal, much less those that were in the opposition. I'm curious how you developed a relationship mm -hmm. with Assad. I mean, it, it, obviously writing a book mm -hmm. helps, but I mean, you, you've interviewed and talked to this guy 
hundreds of times. Well, like in most things, you know, I've been going to Syria consistently since 1989, and I've developed a network of contacts there. And uh, a number of them, since I'm an academic, were in academia yeah. in Syria. And when Bashar al-Assad came to power in 2000, he brought a number of academics into the government, which most people thought at the time was a good thing. You know, not yeah. career apparatchiks, but, but you know, academics. So, right. so what can go wrong if yeah. they're academics, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I knew a lot of these guys, and uh, I uh, posited the idea to one of them that I wanted to write a biography of Bashar al-Assad in about 2002, a couple of years after he came to power, because he had such a non-traditional background. He was a licensed ophthalmologist. He was not uh, ordained or or tapped to, uh, uh, to succeed his father. His older brother was until he died in a car accident, uh, accidentally, in 1994. And then Bashar, who was studying advanced ophthalmology in London at the time, was brought back to Damascus, and he was groomed to uh, take over after his father. And his father died in 2000. So I, made, so I thought that was just a non-traditional way yeah. that uh, you know, the, the quote-unquote typical Arab dictator or authoritarian leader comes to power. And uh, in 2004, I got a call from uh, uh, one of the people uh, in his government, in fact, the, the Syrian ambassador to the United States, who I've known for a long time as well, and he said, uh, David, it's on. By that time, I cl had clean forgotten about it. I yeah. said, what's on? And he said, well, Bashar al-Assad, the president wants to meet with you. And so I started meeting with him in 2004 to write this book in 2005. The first, that new line of Damascus came out in 2005. Um, and then after that, at his request, he said he wanted to continue to meet with me on a regular basis, because at the time, the relationship between the United States and uh, uh, Syria was uh, much less than warm. It was just after the U.S.-led 2003 invasion of Iraq, right. and the U.S. was accusing Syria of sending fighters in and of hiding, you know, weapons of mass destruction, you know, all, uh, from Iraq, all of these types of things. Uh, and so I became quite unintentionally uh, kind of an unofficial liaison between the United States and, uh, and Syria for the remainder of the decade. Yeah. What would you say about him? What did you learn about him personally? Yeah, it, 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 very interesting. Uh, fellow. Uh, when I first met him, he was very unpretentious, uh, almost self-deprecating, you know, and, you know, he was someone in 2004 that didn't quite have all of the power that he would acquire mm -hmm. later on. And it was always very interesting. It was always very, you know, prompt, which for, you know, world leaders is, is not usually the case. Uh, very welcoming. And I've heard this from other people who have met him. This isn't just something, you know, that, uh, you know, was unique to me, but other people that have met him say the same thing over and over. And so that gave people, again, a lot of hope that maybe he was different. Yeah. And, uh, but as happens normally, he grew more comfortable with power. Um, uh, a, a good friend of mine, a scholar, wrote a, wrote a book on, on how these alternative realities are constructed around these authoritarian rulers. Uh, basically sycophants that surround the ruler, yes men, basically, and, and they see the world through a different prism rather than what really exists. And rather than Bashar al-Assad changing the system, as many of us hoped, and many in Syria hoped, the system changed him. And he grew much more comfortable as a leader, but when it's an authoritarian system, that means you're growing much more comfortable being an authoritarian leader. And so, you know, when the 2011 uprisings began, uh, and when the, the uh, the Syrian government uh, used the hammer rather than the velvet glove in reaction eventually, uh, it was not terribly surprising. That was a convulsive, uh, you know, uh, reflexive response by the Syrian government when there is opposition. They hammer it down. They yeah. repress it and get rid of it. When was the last time you interviewed him? In 2009. And uh, I was supposed to see him in 2010. That didn't work out. And then, of course, the uprising began in 2011. I've been in the same building with him uh, since that time, and I asked uh, a Syrian official with whom I was meeting, uh, can I go upstairs and meet with the boss? And uh, they said, no, uh, you know, he's otherwise occupied. Yeah. And I have learned from a number of, uh, of Syrian uh, friends and Syrians close to him that he's not particularly happy with me. That's what I wondered uh, if he had a falling out over something. Yeah, well, look at the name of one of those books. Yeah, Syria, the fall, the, fall of the, the House of, the house of Assad. Assad. Yeah, he, did, he didn't like that one. He didn't one. like yeah. that one. It's yeah. supposed to have a question mark at the yeah. end. But, uh, you know, and plus I've been, you know, critical of him. And in public places I wrote, you know, op-eds in the New York Times that were critical of his policies, critical of his landmark speech he gave, the first one he gave in reaction to the uprisings in, in March uh, 2011. So, and, and the, the Syrian regime, the Syrian government, they're very uh, sensitive to that. Yeah. Uh, an old friend of mine who actually interviewed as the biographer of his father, Hafez al-Assad, he said that to me one time, you could say 99 good things about them, you say one bad thing, and that's the one they're going to remember. Yeah. And they're going to punish you for it. 
Uh, and so despite my attempts to get together with them, they've been rebuffed. I'm still, still trying. Uh, but um, you know, the, thing I, the thing I try to make them understand is that I have accessibility in Washington, in Brussels with the EU, in London and Moscow and Paris, at, uh, New York with the UN. And I have this accessibility because uh, I'm not afraid to criticize you. I'm not seen as a sycophant. I'm not seen as an apologist uh, for the Syrian government. Uh, and so that's what you should want. Someone who gives you a fair shake, but also says what he means and says uh, you know, what he thinks needs to be said. Isn't afraid to ask the tough questions. Isn't afraid to ask the tough questions or make the tough comments, but yeah. uh, we'll see how they react. <laughs> so just today, uh, I was reading that uh, Syrian and uh, Soviet forces mm -hmm. had overtaken another major city in Syria. Mm -hmm. The Global Peace Index ranks Syria last of the countries. I mean, we're talking about a war-torn country is mm -hmm. the definition of a war-torn country. The current situation in Syria, is it getting better than it was no. a year ago? No, it's getting much worse. Uh, you know, the, it, to your question you asked earlier, what has he won? Uh, you know, 80% of the country is below the poverty line. Uh, they have a 60% uh, unemployment rate, yet the 40% who are working are involved or integrated into the war economy. They are soldiers, they are smugglers, they are arms dealers, uh, they are soldiers who are fighting uh, on various sides uh, in the war. So that's not really productive employment. And in this war economy, many of the areas, even under gov government control, are, uh, are controlled by warlords. And uh, they have no interest in seeing the war end because they profit from the war. They have no interest in even seeing the sanctions regime, the intensive sanctions regime that has been placed by the international community led by the US and Europe on Syria. They don't have any interest in seeing that lifted because they're profiting under current conditions. So mm -hmm. this is what Bashar al-Assad you know, has to deal with uh, moving forward, this war economy. And it's, it, the economy is on a precipice right now. Uh, I was just in uh, Geneva a couple months ago and speaking to a number of Syrians who still live in Syria, uh, you know, who have businesses in Syria and uh, polit you know, former political leaders in Syria. Uh, and they say for the first time this winter, it's not just malnutrition to worry about, it's famine. Uh, the crisis in Lebanon has deleteriously affected the situation in Syria. Because Syrian banks and the, uh, the financial system in Syria is under sanction, a lot of money, as it has in the past, goes through Lebanese banks. But with the Lebanese crisis that's occurred, the protests, the political crisis, uh, has led to a banking crisis in Lebanon. That has exacerbated the already dilapidated state in Syria today, where you know, the Syrian pound uh, before this Lebanese crisis was about 500 Syrian pounds per dollar, went up to 750 and then 1,000 Syrian pounds per dollar uh, uh, because of the crisis in Lebanon. So that has, has been horrible timing. Uh, you know, there is extensive Sir, uh, sanctions regime on, on Syria, and particularly with uh, an act called the Caesar Act that was passed by the U.S. government uh, in December, which really targets second, which is really targeting uh, secondary sanctions. Sec mm -hmm. you know, in other words, uh, companies and countries other than the United States to keep them from selling their products or interacting economically with Syria. And though that is, is extensive, it's wide, and it's very, very damaging to Syria. And they, this is the worst they've ever been because their two backers, Russia and Iran, they're also under sanctions. Mm -hmm. And they've already put a lot of money into Syria. And so they're in no position to, to help. And, and you know, this is what the sanctions, at least the intent, is to pressure the Assad regime to make political concessions. Not necessarily remove him from power. I think most uh, leaders in the West, most governments in the West, have given up with that. Yeah. Uh, but to uh, change behavior, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, bring about uh, political reform to some extent that will satisfy the West enough to lift some of the sanctions. The Syrian regime has been consistent in saying no. You know, all of this is a backdoor to try to get rid of us, to try to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. Uh, so we're not even looking in that area. We're not even considering this. But now they have to, I think. Their economy is, is really, really bad. The, the top dogs in the, in the Syrian government don't have to worry about it. They, uh, you know, they get what they want. Uh, they've been living with sanctions for 50 years, and they know how to get around it. They've accumulated wealth. They know how to extract wealth from, a, from a, even a, a poverty-stricken population. Mm -hmm. And they have the support of, of some allies outside of uh, Syria. Um, but the rest of the country is really, really suffering. So it has gotten, I think, precipitously worse over the past year. So political reform has to come in some way, you think? It, it should. Whether it does or not is up to Bashar al-Assad. Uh, I think that they have to. And, uh, you know, again, people close to him keep telling me, we can't go back to the way it was. We have to do something. 
they have, uh, uh, they have uh, introduced what's called this Administrative Law 107. Uh, and it's uh, a law that uh, decentralizes political control uh, at the provincial level, mostly at the municipal level. And that's about as much as they're willing to do uh, at this point. Whether that's enough to satisfy those in the West uh, in order to lift some sanctions in a phased way, uh, you know, we don't know. In fact, that, that, uh, just at the time I was in Geneva, it was really focused on the sanctions regime on Syria. And a lot of people point uh, to Sudan as a model to follow for Syria in the lifting of sanctions. Uh, during the Obama uh, presidency, they, you know, uh, Sudan, which was similarly sanctioned at yeah. the time, was one of the original state sponsors of terrorism in 1979, along with Syria. Uh, what these people s in the U.S., what the Obama administration realized that the sanctions weren't working. Uh, the dictatorial government at the time was continuing on. It was staying there. They weren't changing their behavior. So how can we make this work to our advantage a little bit? And so there were some quid pro quos, particularly in terms of Sudanese help in counterterrorism, which was very important to the Obama administration, still is to the United States uh, at the time, along with some political reform and uh, uh, a lessening of the, the repression in Darfur region and stuff like that. So there is a model to move forward while Bashar al-Assad remains in power. Uh, but they have to make some concessions, and those concessions are going to have to be some level of political reform. And uh, they're not ready yet. But that's all against the backdrop of a guy who, for lack of a better word, is paranoid that he's going to lose power. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, the Syrian population as a whole is very paranoid toward the outside world and has been for some time because of decades of imperialist machinations in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, they, there are real and imagined uh, imperialist plots uh, against the country, but enough have occurred and enough have been real to make them think that they're all real. And it's also self-serving to the regime, to the right. government, in the sense that we keep the military security apparatus at high alert because we're always under attack from the outside. So when Bashar al-Assad, he gave that speech on March 30th, 2011, his first, as I said earlier, his first speech that dealt with uh, the uprising, he blamed it all on external evil forces from the outside, external mm -hmm. forces like the U.S., like Israel, and, and so forth. And the thing is, that plays to a certain audience in Syria because they've been uh, almost brainwashed to believe that sort of environment. You know, that's their conceptual paradigm. That's how they see the outside world. It's not entirely wrong. It's, it's certainly embellished. And it is self-serving, uh, but he, you know, re it resonated with a certain audience. And, and to some degree, it was a little bit arrogant. Uh, and I said it at the time, which is probably why he doesn't want to <laughs> meet with me yeah. anymore, in the sense that you know, this bubble constructed around him was that the people loved him. The people you know, were happy with him. They were, making, they were making some progress in some important areas, administrative reform, monetary reform, educational reform under his watch. It wasn't a, a, you know, a total wash. Uh, and so it had to be external forces because mm -hmm. my people couldn't do this on their own. They had to be given money right. and bribed and, and uh, they're, they They love me. They love me. Yeah. So this can't be happening. Yeah. I want to apologize to our audience out there. I think I said Soviet and Syrian forces. I meant Russian I do it all Syrian the time. Forces. We're, we're, children, okay. we're okay. children of the I, Cold I, War. I think that's yeah. where it comes from. Yeah. I do it all that time. And, and I also want to let uh, people that are watching through the Trinity live stream and the, K the KSAT live stream, but particularly the Trinity live stream, we have the opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Lesh if you would like to, and we'll get to those questions uh, before this live webinar is over, that's for sure. But let's, let's talk about the assassination of Iranian General Qassem Soleimani. Right. What effect does that have in Syria? How does that play in Syria? Does it play into the paranoia we were just talking about? Mm -hmm. It could. I mean, uh, you know, I, I heard some sources saying Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, an ally of Iran, of course, and of Syria, he was uh, heightening up his uh, protective detail even more than it already is because mm -hmm. he is afraid he might be next on the hit list. I'm sure yeah. Bashar al-Assad has crossed his mind uh, as well. It's, um, there's a moment of disorientation right now in Damascus uh, with Soleimani assassinated because the Iranian presence in in Syria was Soleimani, and Soleimani was the Iranian presence in Syria. It was all him. And, uh, you know, is, is the Iranian presence going to be, you know, uh, is, is their footprint going to be extinguished? No, not anytime soon. They have a widespread footprint. It's very deep. Uh, you know, there's still about 80,000 Iranian and pro-Iranian uh, soldiers on the ground uh, in Syria. Uh, their, their influence goes beyond just the military, but also economic and a little bit even socio-culturally. Uh, uh, however, 
the alliance between Syria and Iran, which began in 1979, 1980, is really strategic in nature. Uh, they're quite different, at least the leaderships are quite different. Yes. You have a theocratic leadership, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and then in Syria you have a Baathist, Arab nationalist, Alawite regime, which is as secular as you can get. Uh, and that was maybe at one time more aligned with Iraq than Iran. Yeah, sure, they, they were aligned with the Arab world and yes. not non-Arab Iran. Yeah. You know, it's natural allies in the Arab world, and then this, this alliance came about primarily because Syria and Iraq became enemies, and so the enemy of my enemy is my yeah. friend, so that brought Syria and Iran together. And, but it's strategic in nature, and it's somewhat awkward uh, because they're so different culturally and socially and politically. And I know a lot of Syrians from Bashar al-Assad on down who've never been quite comfortable with it. He told me on a couple of occasions he's willing to make a deal. You know, I will reduce the Iranian footprint in Syria. I will reduce the Hezbollah footprint in Lebanon. This is before the uprising, of yes. course, in 2011, in exchange for certain things like the Golan Heights from, from Israel. So he was willing to consider these things. Now, you know, who knows, because Iran is primarily, along with Russia, responsible for keeping in in power. Uh, so it would be much harder to get, to get rid of Iran. However, you know, Bashar al-Assad used to sit with Qasem Soleimani just like you and I are sitting right now. And whenever that happened, Qasem Soleimani was the dominant force. He was the dominant figure. He has mythic status. And so Bashar was a subordinate. He was, you know, he was, in, he was an inferior to him. So he, you know, uh, Qasem Soleimani dictated to him rather than the other way around. Now that's not the case. And that's very important when you have such a, a pyramidal structure like Syria where a lot depends on just one person. You know, so if he's now talking to the new Iranian uh, uh, general who is, who is uh, representing Iran in Syria, they have nowhere near the status of Soleimani. And that's important. And so there's a moment of disorientation. The guys who recognize it first were the Russians. Vladimir Putin went in a few days after that. And I have a Syrian uh, a friend who's very close to the Syrian uh, uh, leader and government, and particularly their intelligence apparatus. He, he told me, he said, you know, Putin went in there to say, Syria's ours, not yours, Iran. Because although Russia and Iran are tacitly allies in support of uh, uh, the Syrian government in the civil war, uh, they have some differences. They've been, they've been jostling about and tussling with each, other, uh, with each other over reconstruction contracts economically. Uh, they've been uh, jousting with each other in terms of trying to get predominant influence in the intelligence apparatus in Syria, as well as in the Syrian army. Uh, so they're not necessarily on the same wavelength. You know, at a, at a general level, they are. Below that, there are some differences. So let me ask the question here with Syria, Russia, Iran, how does the United States fit into Syria now and in the future? Well, not much uh, right now. I mean, we, we have withdrawn most of our troops We've uh, uh, in the Trump administration and, and even to a certain extent in the Obama administration. They decided not to support assertively the Syrian opposition. And the reason being primarily, I, I have a good friend who was in the room in the National Security Council with Obama, and Obama always said, uh, tell me that if we intervene more assertively, that the Russians and Iranians are just going to up our ante. And if they do that, what are we going to do? Yeah. And it just spirals out of control. And there was also the Iranian uh, uh, U.S. secret negotiations on the nuclear deal, right. and the Obama administration didn't, wanna, didn't want to uh, disrupt that by intervening too much against mm -hmm. Iran in Syria with more troops or more arms for the opposition. So we've, we've you know, Obama and then Trump has actually uh, accelerated our withdrawal from the, the, the scene in Syria. We still have some troops in the Northeast protecting some oil wells, gives us a little bit of leverage, uh, gives us a little bit of leverage in terms of maintaining our, our relationship with uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, largely Kurdish uh, dominated in the Northeast, uh, that could play a role in terms of uh, having uh, some say in what may or may not be a political settlement down the line. The Russians want us out, the Syrians want us out, the Iranians want us out, uh, but I think it's important to have some sort of presence there, to have some sort of say in the shape of a final political settlement, again, that may or may not come about in the near future. Okay, I have one more question for you. David, Thomas, Steve, I see your questions, we're gonna get to them next, but what are the long-term prospects for the country of Syria? I, uh, you know, Syria became like a second home to me. I've, I've traveled there some 30 plus times. I've lived there for months at a time. Uh, I have a great deal of faith in the, in the Syrian people, in their resilience, in their entrepreneurial uh, creativity, which they've already shown in getting around sanctions for yes. 50 years and have been showing the last uh, number of years. Uh, 
However, this is a tough nut. This, this is a very tough situation. They need about $300 billion uh, reconstruction aid. Uh, you know, half the country is internally or externally uh, displaced. Uh, you know, it's a public health disaster. Uh, former diseases such as typhoid and cholera and, and tuberculosis and hepatitis A. Just you as know, we look at some of the yeah, video here. Some right here. Yeah, yeah. that, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, they've, uh, they've are recurring now. Uh, uh, polio, which was eradicated, was probably brought in by Af fighters, uh, pro-government fighters from Afghanistan or Pakistan, and that's been reintroduced into Syria. And their public health system has been terribly degraded. Uh, in addition to their educational system, half the children uh, now are not in school, so it's a generation lost. Uh, a lot of money and, and uh, skill set uh, left the country early, and they're going to stay outside the country. They don't want to go back. Why would they go back to a situation that's where you know, they, they left in the first right, place. Right. So the prospects are, are not bright. You know, we're, we're talking about a generation of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of hoped for, you know, incremental reform, uh, aid coming in, uh, and a rebuilding uh, of the country. And the thing that most people don't understand is that there's physical healing and physical restructuring, but there's also emotional reconstitution. Yes. And that's just as hard, if not harder. A lot of blood was spilt. There's a lot of hatred in the country. Uh, just getting various groups together to talk about these things and to live among once an, you know, one another without trying to kill each other, uh, without uh, revenge, uh, is going to be a tall task. And this is going to take a very long time and a lot of work and help from the international community. All right, let's get to some of our questions right now. Let's start with David. What is the future for the Afghan mercenaries that Iran has deployed and settled into Syria? Hmm. Good question. And basically, we really don't know. They're going to be there as long as needed, as long as uh, Syria still needs boots on the ground. Uh, you know, the Syrian army itself, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, as an effective fighting force, has been diminished uh, tremendously over the course of the Civil War. You know, I'd say there's probably only about 20, 30,000 real fighting forces in the Syrian Arab army. They're spread fairly thinly. Now they're concentrated in Idlib in the northwest because they're trying to retake that particular uh, province. So they need boots on the ground. And they need Iranian troops. They need Hezbollah troops. Uh, they need these militias that were brought in from Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. Uh, so as long as they're needed, and as long as, as the Syrian government and, the, and Iran itself wants to uh, you know, participate uh, in the retaking of these territories, they're going to be needed. And in, and in addition to the fact, as we just talked about, you know, there's a bit of a tussle between Russia and Iran over uh, how much of a footprint each should have in the country. And Iran wants a much more in-depth and wider footprint. And so having these militias that are pro-Iran, Iran is the one who really brought these in, uh, that helps uh, in terms of uh, gaining their objectives inside Syria. Uh, Thomas has our next question. Thank you for this question, Thomas. And it's, it's kind of along the lines of one that you've already answered, but you might want to expand on it a mm -hmm. little bit. Will Soleimani's death significantly diminish Iran's capacity to operate within Syria? And if so, to what extent will it do so? It won't significantly, as we spoke about earlier. Certainly not in the near term. Um, but I mentioned this moment of, of disorientation. Uh, I think there's an opportunity right now in my own mind, uh, maybe no one else's, but at least in my own mind, uh, and as I said earlier, Russia had it as well, is you know, to take advantage of this to uh, reduce the Iranian footprint, because Soleimani was such a, a dominant figure. And it plays into, or we'll find out actually, if those elements in, in Syria that I thought had a, you know, felt that the relationship with Iran was awkward uh, or was only, you know, necessary for strategic reasons, we'll find out for sure whether or not they take this opportunity to maybe uh, diminish the uh, Iranian footprint. But it's, it's not going to be extinguished in any significant way. It's not going to be reduced in any significant way in the near term. But I think it does create an interesting opportunity. For those that are watching on KSAT.com, we're having a discussion with Dr. David Lesh from Trinity University, an expert uh, who has met uh, Bashar al-Assad many times, and uh, we're discussing Syria now. The future has Assad actually won the war. Steve Weiland has the next question. Is the Lebanese banking crisis a function of the Syrian disorder, or is it driven by different factors with a detrimental impact on Syria? Uh, I think that it's more so the latter. It's more, uh, you know, factors that are indigenous to uh, Lebanon as well as uh, the region as a whole. And globally, we see these types of protests occurring in, in Hong Kong, in Venezuela, uh, as well as in the Middle East and in Iraq and, of course, uh, in Lebanon. 
And it's almost, as some people have said, it's almost like the second wave of the Arab Spring that began in 2010 and, and 2011 that did, in fact, help cause the Syrian uh, civil war. Uh, so I think that's more indigenous factors, more factors uh, that uh, have to do with the global environment, regional and global environment, rather than Syria. The, the situation in Syria doesn't help, in particular the fact that you know, there are about a million Syrian refugees uh, in Lebanon, which has very much stressed the uh, Lebanese economy. Uh, and you know, perhaps exacerbated an existing uh, situation that was less than ideal economically and politically. Uh, thank you for that question. Thomas has a question. What effect will Soleimani's killing impact? How will, um, I'll just rephrase it here. How will Soleimani's killing impact the Kurds in Syria, and how will Turkey play into this? I don't think the Soleimani uh, assassination will, will directly impact the Kurds, uh, other than perhaps... Uh, you know, pushing the Syrian regime to make a deal. Uh, because if the Iranian footprint is reduced, if the Russian footprint is enhanced, the Russians want the Syrian government to make a deal with the Kurds. Uh, the, um, the, the Turks don't necessarily want it, particularly if it accords the Kurds in the Northeast uh, more autonomy, which the Turks, from their point of view, uh, see as a threat uh, to their own Kurdish uh, population that wants autonomy, if not outright independence. So perhaps uh, indirectly, for the, for the Turks, they're at, a, they're at a particular tipping point themselves. Um, they wanted to get rid of Assad. That didn't work. They, they, you know, they, that failed. Uh, Assad is here to stay, and there are rumblings in, in Turkey right now that they're ready, maybe not to make amends, but to deal with Assad again. Uh, Russia uh, had the intelligence uh, chiefs uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Syria, the Syrian government, as well as Turkey, in Moscow recently to try to come to some sort of modus vivendi. And for the Turks, economically, they're suffering economically as well. I mean, and Syria was their gateway to the, to the Middle East in terms of trade. Um, and they had good relations, you know, in the five years or so. In fact, very good relations before the, before the uprising and civil war began. So opening up that market and, and getting reconstruction contracts, which perhaps the Russians can get, give to them or maybe take away from the Iranians to give to the Turks, that's very much important to the, the Turks as well. So you know, they're at a point right now where they've accepted that their original plan regarding Assad removing him hasn't worked. Uh, they pretty much accepted him in power, and they want to make sure that, the, that they have a military presence uh, along the border, if not in northern Syria, that keeps any sort of Kurdish autonomy at bay. Uh, and that's going to take a while. That'll take more diplomacy than anything else. Uh, and they don't want a, you know, a swath of Syrian refugees coming into Turkey, adding to the millions that are already there and already stressing their economy. So it's a very, it's a very delicate situation for Turkey right now, but they're at a tipping point. In fact, I think they're past the tipping point they're now realized they have to, in some level, either through the Russians or directly deal with the regime in uh, the government in Syria. So we're talking about a crisis here in Syria where we know, I mean, getting an exact figure on casualties and uh, yeah. refugees and things like that is kind of difficult. And, and Alan asked the next question, what percentage of the original population of Syria remains? What percentage has left? Well, uh, I, mean, half, I know it's yeah. hard to put uh, an exact figure. Yeah, there's on about that. Uh, 22 million uh, Syrians prior uh, to the uh, uh, war, and uh, as I said earlier, half are internally displaced or externally displaced. Of that 11 million, uh, about half of those are externally displaced, primarily in Turkey, in Jordan, uh, and in Lebanon, and a few sprinkled, you know, made their way into Europe, as we know from so you're the migration five, crisis. Five, six million people. Yeah, five, six million people. And the thing is, does the Syrian government want them back? Uh, these are people that left, and so the Syrian government considers them probably they don't like us. You know, they're, they're in the opposition. They support the opposition. So we really don't want them back. And the Syrian economy is so dilapidated right now, I don't think they have the wherewithal, the means uh, to settle five, six million uh, people in terms of housing or so forth. And in any event, many of those that have been coming back in, they're immediately conscripted if they're male at a certain age into the Syrian army. Mm -hmm. So that's keeping away a lot of these refugees who may come back. But, you know, a lot of these refugees, um, they're educated with a secondary or university education. Uh, they have money that they use to get out of Syria. Uh, they have a certain skill set. Uh, many of them are under 35 years old. 
Most of them are under 35 years old. These are exactly the people Syria needs to bring back in to help rebuild the country. Yet they don't want to come back in. The Syrian government, for the most part, doesn't want them to come back in. Again, a lot of fear and paranoia exactly. playing out there. All right, Linda has a great question next. How significantly has the ongoing warfare impacted ancient and historical architecture uh, and artifacts in Syria? This is uh, a great question, and it's a very sad one for me because uh, you know, I got to know quite well almost all of the uh, archaeological sites and antiquities that exist in Syria. Uh, just for example, uh, Palmyra, uh, called Tadmor in, in Syria. Uh, one of the, if not the best, uh, preserved uh, Roman city uh, in the Middle East, in the entire world, perhaps. It's in the middle of the desert, so it was able to survive. You know, cities weren't built on top of it that use the building, the pre-existing buildings to build new ones. So it largely was intact. You could see the whole city planning. I've been there 10 times. Almost every time I go to Syria, I like to go out there. And you're almost on your own because Syria hasn't been a real tourist haven yeah. uh, over the decades. And um, when ISIS came in and they took Palmyra, uh, of course, you know, ISIS being an extreme Islamic sect saw any sort of, of uh, buildings that, um, that were built for pre-Islamic uh, gods or idols. Uh, as an anthema, and so they, and so they destroyed uh, much of that. Uh, the the head of uh, uh, the antiquities in Palmyra, the head of the museum uh, in Palmyra, was a good friend of mine, uh, Khalid al Assad, no relation to the to the uh, president, and 80, 80 years old or something. And he uh, he is a good friend. He became a good friend. He he personally brought me on on uh, tours of Palmyra, and. Um, uh, he stayed. When ISIS came, most everyone left. He stayed because these ruins were his children. Yeah. And he's not going to abandon them. And, and hopefully he would work out a deal with ISIS. He ended up being beheaded. Um, and you know, I remember seeing a picture of him and his dark, thick glasses, you know, on a pike, you know, that they, they had. <sighs> and, uh, and so, you know, there are groups. This is what happens in war. There are groups that, that act for today and not for tomorrow, and they don't care about the past or they reject the past. And so uh, there's been a lot of collateral damage, much more so than even the people that are there. Uh, on the other hand, you have the Croc de Chevalier. It's a crusader castle halfway between Tartus on the coast and Homs uh, in the center, just north of, northwest of Damascus. Best preserved crusader castle in the world, uh, in the Middle East. And it's an amazing place. Again, been there almost every time I go to Syria. I try to, to make a trip there. The walls are so thick that it's been used in the Civil War by opposition troops and by Syrian troops as a fort. And it's actually withstood artillery, modern artillery, much less that which existed in the, you know, the uh, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. It withstood that today. And so you, and now you have a, a Syrian uh, armed garrison uh, in this Crusader castle. Uh, so hopefully, you know, it obviously been damaged somewhat, but that's a case where it is so impregnable and was so impregnable for such a long time that it, it's still there. It still withstands. Mm -hmm. All right, Andrew Green said he had you as a student mm. for your first semester at Trinity. Wow, that's a long time ago. <laughs> he says, what are the chances? I look the same, right? I yeah, look the same, yeah. okay. <laughs> what are the chances of the Syrian war spilling over into Lebanon with the current issues going on there? Yeah, I think right now uh, it, it's a limited concern. I think. This was a, a bigger concern earlier in the Civil War, when the parameters of the Civil War, the nature of the Civil War was still being worked out, when the external stakeholders, uh, such as the Saudis and the Turks and the Iranians and the Russians and the U.S., uh, were you know, figuring out how much they are going to get involved in this war. That's the time when I think there was, uh, and when Hezbollah became much more involved in the war from Lebanon, that was the time when uh, I think there was a real concern about spillover. Right now, you know, most of the Acute fighting is over with throughout much of the country. It's still happening in Idlib, of course, and it is very intense there. And it's still happening in pockets elsewhere at the country. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, it's been confined to Syria. And, of course, one of the, the main things I feared uh, was uh, a conflict not uh, between Syria and another country. It was between Iran and Israel because Israel wanted to make sure that Iran's footprint didn't become too deep, especially mm -hmm. in terms of their military presence. And so Iran, uh, excuse me, Israel carried out attacks against Iranian positions, Hezbollah positions, and even some Syrian positions uh, in Syria, all over Syria, in fact. And, you know, how Iran would respond to that, how Hezbollah responded to that, was always, you know, very much in my mind a threat of spiraling out of control into an Israeli-Iranian conflict that would not be confined to Syria, would be 
it would spread throughout the region. And I think the Russians, more than anyone else, uh, are responsible for making sure that Israel and Iran, you know, main, you know, kept to certain red lines and didn't overreact to provocations by the other. Uh, and uh, Russia has a good relationship with uh, the Israeli leadership. Putin and Netanyahu meet, uh, have met quite frequently. Uh, and of course, the, the Russians meet with the Iranians quite frequently. So I think in that sense, they've done a good job at maintaining some separation there. Uh, anonymous attendee wants to know, could you talk about the impact of the displaced refugee population upon European allies, especially with the U.S. significantly curtailing the refugee programs? Yeah, uh, you know, there's two sides of this. There's the refugee side, and then there's the political side in Europe. The refugee side, it's horrible. You know, they are uh, going in the path of least resistance and trying to find a new future, and some countries in Europe are opening up their doors, and some uh, are not. Uh, in some, the, the fear of, of migration uh, and immigration, just like uh, in this country, in the United States, has become politicized. Uh, and uh, in certain European countries, it's been used as a way uh, to stoke fear uh, of the outside and of the other, and about these immigrants coming in and that they're anything but you know, normal and anything but people that just want a better life for themselves and their, and their family, but that they're actual threats. This actually played into the Brexit uh, thing in, in, uh, right. in Britain. Uh, to a certain degree, uh, and it fed into uh, you know uh, certain uh, right of center responses and parties, and uh, uh, you know very right wing parties in some countries in in Europe uh, coming to power. They played on these fears, uh, these nationalistic fears uh, and prejudicial fears, uh, and so that certainly had uh, an impact uh, politically more so than really on the ground. But for the refugees themselves. Some have integrated, some have established themselves in, in uh, countries in Europe, uh, whether or not they go back at some point in the future, if when Syria uh, becomes a more welcoming place, that remains to be seen. Uh, Mark Tice wants to know, do you believe the current Syrian government is or will be willing to make significant political concessions in order to access reconstruction capital from mm -hmm. the West? Hi, Mark. Um, I think they have to. I mean, I really think they have to. It, it's, it's a matter of degree. Uh, as we were saying earlier, you know, they desperately want sanctions lifted. Uh, according to my contacts, again, that are very close to Bashar al-Assad and, and other parts of the Syrian government, the military security apparatus, they want sanctions lifted first in health and education, uh, which is surprising. You'd think they want sanctions lifted on individuals, on Bashar yeah. al-Assad, on, you know, his family, on uh, his cohorts. Uh, but it's that, because they realize that they're losing their legitimacy, if not already. You know, any legitimacy they've gained in terms of quote unquote winning the, the war, they may be losing because they're losing the post-war atmosphere. And so unless they get some of these sanctions, unless they start rebuilding some schools, unless they start rebuilding hospitals, unless they start getting the equipment to refurbish these hospitals and computers to go in these schools, you know, the population as a whole are going to turn against them because you know, when you claim victory, people expect a victory dividend. And it's not coming. It's not coming. It's getting worse. And so, you know, in, in I know, uh, and Mark, you know, that uh, there are, uh, um, you know, there are, uh, they are reaching out a little bit. There are, they are a little bit more open to considering this quid pro quo of political concessions versus sanctions reform, when at first they weren't. I mean, I went to London and met with uh, a group of Syrians who were very, again, very close to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Uh, this was about a year and a half ago, uh, and they were so cocky. They were like, we won the war, you didn't, you lost, mm -hmm. you're on the losing side, that is, mm -hmm. you know, the American and European side of the table that was there. Uh, you have to come to us. So we're not making any concessions. So it was very cocky, very arrogant, and perhaps, you know, from a certain degree, understandably so, because right. they won and, and they feel betrayed by the opposition, so they shouldn't get a thing. You know, these guys turned against us. They have a very paternalistic attitude toward their population. We took care of you. You rose up against us, so don't expect anything from us. But they're going to have to. Again, the, the socioeconomic and political situation has changed, I think, far beyond they realize. I think they're realizing the economic circumstances right now are absolutely dire. And so they've been expressing some interest in talking, which is a first step. Uh, but anything in terms of you know, but, but they're really worried about any sort of concessions, like the Geneva Communique of 2012 that talked about transition. You know, they look at that as a Trojan horse. They look at that as trying to do 
through UN resolutions what the opposition couldn't do militarily, overthrow right. the, the Assad government. Uh, so they're very sensitive about that. And so they're going to want political concessions on their terms. At most right now, maybe Administrative Law 107 at the municipal level. Uh, I don't think that's going to be enough, uh, but we'll see. We'll see how desperate they are. You know, we'll see how desperate things get. Uh, again, you know, these authoritarian governments have a tremendous ability to extract wealth uh, and goods and services from a very, even a poverty-stricken population. Uh, they've done it a long time so far, and they're prepared to do it, I think, uh, more so in the future. And they'll have to do it unless they make some of these concessions. Randolph Shelton asks, can you comment on the reduction of U.S. forces in Syria, the reports of Russians taking over some of the former U.S. posts, and what the future might look like in light of the recent Russian push to expand their influence and territory? Yeah, the, the, um, I'm not terribly worried about Russia uh, expanding their influence in Syria. Syria, during the Cold War, when it was the Soviet Union, yeah. was a Soviet client state. It was a Russian client state. The U.S. You know, really had very little economic or political interest or influence in, in Syria. To the extent that it existed, it was always a function of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, so I'm not terribly concerned about Russia's uh, uh, territorial ambitions uh, in Syria. They really don't have any territorial. They want, that, they want to build up their, their uh, naval base in Tartus. They want to build up the the, uh, the uh, air base that they built during the Civil War in, uh, up in the north outside of uh, Latakia, um, that's their interest. And it's their interest to get a political settlement as soon as possible that will crown their military victory so that they can become a political broker in the Middle East. They already become the political broker in Syria, and they're itching to become more of a political broker, especially as the U.S., from their view, and many people in the Middle East, is receding in terms of their interest not only in Syria but in other parts of, of the Middle East uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, Russia, you know, while wanting to maintain their strategic uh, presence in Syria, uh, they don't really want to, uh, they, they want a political settlement. They want the U.S. out, definitely. And there's always concern of a U.S.-Russian confrontation. There have been a few recently where, you know, the, the U.S. has prevented some Russian convoys of soldiers from getting to a certain oil well, uh, oil site in northeast uh, Syria. And you never know if, if some of those can spiral out of control. There was one case a couple of years ago where U.S. air power just decimated dozens, if not hundreds, of Russian mercenary soldiers. The Russians tended to downplay it, of course, yeah. but it was a message sent by the U.S., don't come into this area. So there's already been a confrontation. Now, you know, it, something like that can always happen, and it could always be a tripwire to something more. I think there's enough deconfliction um, uh, communication between the United States and Russia to prevent that from happening in the skies as well as uh, on the ground. Uh, but the U.S. presence has been tremendously diminished. It's on the way out. Everyone there knows the U.S. was going to leave at some point. They didn't know it was going to be so precipitously and so soon and leave the Kurds hanging devoid of any leverage in terms of their negotiations with the Turks, the Russians, or the Syrian government. Uh, and that's the problem. It's not that the U.S. left, is that they did so in a fairly precipitous manner. Right. And the, the, no, the notions that come with that, the idea that the United States maybe doesn't want to be a player in the Middle East. That's anymore. right. That's right. We're not here to stay. So it, here's an interesting question about the Golan Heights. Ah. Uh, Joseph Ballot says, what is Dr. Lesh's take on Golan Heights and the recent annexation? Has Assad abandoned that issue with bigger problems on his plate? Hey, Joe, hope your law practice is going well in, in Houston. <laughs> Good to hear from you, old time student. Um, good question. No, he hasn't given it up. And I actually wrote a little piece that uh, was published a, few, I don't know, a couple years ago that advocated the idea that it was actually an interesting time to, put, to, to make a deal on the Golan Heights. From the Syrian point of view, as, as you already know, you know, it's been ingrained in the Syrian population that the Golan Heights is the sine qua non of Syrian foreign policy, getting back the Golan Heights uh, you know, that part of it which was lost in the 1967 war with Israel. You know, people in Syria get emotional about it. They start crying about it, you know, in the years that I've been going there. And that was the signature event. That's not the signature event anymore. Yeah. The signature event is the civil war. And the young, you know, growing up now, this is what's shaping, you know, their worldview. This is what's shaping, you know, what they want to see happen in the future. Uh, recovery, rebuilding, reconstitution. The Golan Heights, who cares, you know, for that generation? And so Assad, I think, has some incentive, perhaps, to 
move on the Golan Heights, despite, despite U.S. recognition of Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights. That's really symbolic. The, the Israelis can still deal. And they actually, even under this government, under Netanyahu, ironically, because Netanyahu has no sort of religious commitment at all to the Golan Heights. Most Israelis don't, as opposed to the West Bank mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and Jerusalem. And so, and he actually negotiated uh, secretly with the Syrians uh, uh, some years ago in, in, during his first term uh, in office, uh, a, a return of the Golan Heights. So there are elements in both sides, and I've talked to both sides on this. There are elements that are still willing to deal. So it's not a lost cause. What I'm saying from the Syrian point of view, from Assad's point of view, I think he needs to move more quickly on this. Now, it's not going to be done in a vacuum. It's not going to be a, you know, a, a bilateral deal. It has to be done, I think, within the, the construct of a, of a political settlement that has to include the Iranians at some point. So that's going to be much more complicated than it has been in the past, which was mostly just the U.S. trying to broker a bilateral deal between Syria and Israel to Golan Heights. And it came very, very close, some say within 10 meters yeah. uh, in the 1990s and late 1990s. And some, many people thought they had a deal in 2000 between Syria and Israel, which would have reshaped the future of the Middle East. That, it, it's one of those, you know, uh, what very what, yeah, exactly, and unfortunate what ifs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still a possibility, and I wouldn't rule it out. So, uh, Ron Fortin, since we're talking about the Golan Heights, and this has certainly been discussed, uh, Ron says he's a former Dr. Lesh modern Middle East student here. Yeah. Your prediction on how the recently announced Israeli-Palestinian peace plan will affect Syria, Iran, Palestine, and the region in general? Uh, I'm glad, Ron, your questions uh, have become much less uh, complicated since, uh, <laughs> since you were my student. Uh, bravo. Um, yeah, the, um, it, 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 it remains to be seen. You know, the, the Israeli-Palestinian issue has become much more boxed in than it used to be in the past. Uh, it used to be the primary issue in the Arab world. At every Arab League summit meeting, you know, the Palestinian issue was number one. That's no longer the case. You know, you have Israel now working directly or indirectly with countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, with the United Arab Emirates, with Egypt, and so forth, particularly in terms of of the uh, Iran dynamic in, uh, in the Middle East, because both Saudi Arabia and a number of other countries, especially, especially in the Gulf, along with Israel, that's their number one enemy. And so that has brought them together, which therefore has undercut the level of support for the Palestinian cause. And, and this is why that whole dynamic, in effect, in addition to the turn in the Israeli political system from the failure of previous attempts that has moved to the right, and that has repeatedly elected someone like Benjamin Netanyahu. You know, all of these things have made, uh, have lessened the uh, chances for what I think is a, an equitable deal on the Israeli-Palestinian front. Uh, it, it has allowed for this opportunity for the Trump administration to put forth a deal that, that uh, certainly the parts of it I have read is very one-sided on the side of Israel and that the Palestinians have rejected and will continue to reject. The problem is, are there any Arab states that are going to reject it as forcefully? Uh, and, and therefore, um, you know, that it, it remains to be seen uh, how much of that dynamic will spread outside of the Israeli-Palestinian box. Uh, and will it just remain in that box? If it remains in that box, the Palestinians have much more leverage, and therefore the Israelis have much more leverage to do what, whatever the hell they want to do. Uh, it's not really going to affect Syria as much, uh, other than to the extent that Syrians still has a number of Palestinian refugee and refugee camps uh, in Syria. Uh, they still uh, support uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, Hamas, the uh, uh, Islamist uh, group within the Palestinian movement, uh, mostly in the Gaza Strip. Uh, so, you know, maybe a little bit of that dynamic involved, but Syria right now has much more, you know, uh, immediate matters to deal with. Uh, we have about four minutes left, a little under four minutes now, and uh, how you doing? I'm doing, doing a lot of talking. I'm doing I'm great. Sure you're all right. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> and somebody, uh, anonymous attendee, wants to know when the civil war is over, what are the ramifications for President Assad, if any? Um, I mean, in a in a way, he believes the war is over. I mean, he, in, in essence, has won, uh, in the sense that the opposition, there's no way they're going to overthrow him. Now, you never know if something can happen. Right. You know, an assassination. He could slip on, you know, going down the stairs, and he have perhaps a whole house of cards falling down. Uh, but for he himself, 
I think he feels vindicated. Uh, you know, he's outlasted those who have opposed them in the West, in Syria itself, throughout uh, much of the Middle East. Um, you know, I, I believe quite sincerely that he felt he was saving the country, or he convinced himself or was convinced that what he was doing in terms of the military response to the uprising and civil war that's produced you know, upwards of 500,000 people being killed on both sides. Uh, he believes, and I think he really does believe, that he saved the country. He thinks it's bigger than him. He thinks it's bigger than him. And this is the funny thing, and, that, and maybe we'll leave on this very controversial okay. point. And it'll probably will light up a little bit here. Who knows? <laughs> you know, why not? Um, is, um, I wrote a piece uh, a few years back with my colleague here at Trinity University, Kerry Lattimore, who's uh, head of the history department, and he's a Civil War specialist. Um, and we wrote uh, uh, an essay comparing Assad to Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. And that in and of itself, very few people would publish that. To right, begin with. Right, Finally, right. one very intrepid and, and creative uh, publisher published it. And basically what I was saying is that, you know, Abraham Lincoln leveled cities. Union forces leveled cities in the South. Uh, the South hated him. They wanted to assassinate him, and one of them did. Mm -hmm. Look at the websites you know, in the South in particular today. There are some websites that are vehemently anti-Abraham Lincoln. But he is uni almost universally considered in the United States to be the, the top president. When they rate the president, president, he's always number one because he kept the country together. So for Assad, this maybe responds to the question earlier, if he, ke he kept the country together, uh, will the history books 50, 100 years from now look back on him as being that president that kept the country together? And it all comes down to success. Abraham Lincoln kept the country together. He set up a remarkable tone for reconciliation in his second inaugural address, you know, uh, malice uh, toward none and charity for all. And Assad needs to do that. And, and in the article, I was basically calling on him to make that magnanimous gesture, and not just on the surface, make it real. Because reconciliation is important. And if reconciliation occurs, and if Syria becomes a successful state into the future, the way we look at him now as a brutal dictator, which was the same way I, uh, Lincoln was looked at, even by some of his supporters as a dictator, it could totally change. Again, we can't think of that way now, but as a historian, I like to project myself 50, yeah. 100 years in the future. It's up to Assad. You know? And if he's watching, <laughs> you know, Bashar, do what you need to do. You know, make that gesture. Really agree to re reconciliation and reconstruct the country and welcome back in the half that have obviously been alienated. It's not too late. It's not too late. I don't think so. All right. Dr. David Lesh with Trinity University, thank you. Thank you. We have a lot uh, more questions left. I apologize that we just basically ran out of time. Uh, for those watching on KSAT.com, thank you. For those watching on the Trinity live stream, want to give you a note. The next webinar is scheduled for February 27th at noon. The discussion will be on what the Iliad can teach us about conflict resolution, featuring a lively conversation with Dr. Michael Fisher, Janet S. Dick Professor in the Public Humanities Department of English at Trinity University. It's all of our time today. Thank you for watching, and go Tigers. <laughs>